I just, there were some funny quotes about Thanksgiving. I just, I caught a few of them and I thought I might share them with you. Irma Bombeck had a couple things to say about Thanksgiving. She said, uh, she said, well, what we're really talking about is a wonderful day set aside on the fourth Thursday of November when no one diets. What else, why else would they call it Thanksgiving? <laughs> one day, nobody's dieting. She said she came from a I came from a family where gravy was considered a beverage. <laughs> and there's a humorist named Kevin James. I think he's been on TV a lot. He said, Thanksgiving, man, not a good day to be my pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good result. Jay Leno was on the same page. He said, you can tell you ate too much for Thanksgiving when you have to let your bathrobe out. <laughs> That's bad. That's a little bad. Then I have a, a joke about uh, Black Friday. Any of you go out shopping? Got a little bit of shopping done, okay. Well, there was a small business owner, I might have shared this before, but a small business owner, and he was uh, really dismayed when a new uh, kind of corporate chain of business, similar to his own, opened up right next door and he put up a huge sign that said, Best Black Friday Deals. Then he was horrified when practically the next day another uh, business owner came in on his other side, another competitor, similar business, putting up an even larger sign that said, Lowest Black Friday Prices. Thought, oh, what the heck is he going to do? He got started to panic until he got a, a bright idea. And he made a sign, the biggest sign of all, and he put it up over his shop that said, Main Entrance. <laughs> <laughs> Smart, huh? <laughs> Smart. Well, we're sort of into that season, that gift giving season, aren't we? Um, I don't know, maybe if any of you have started doing any gift shopping yet or thinking about that. But it seemed, because we're heading into that, it seems like maybe a good time to um, do some reflection on, on gift giving, on uh, what make for effective gifts, what lessons have we drawn over the years on what make for the best gifts, uh, what makes our gift giving um, the most fulfilling um, or the least fulfilling. Um, there's a lot of scripture, there's a lot of spiritual teachings about giving, about giving. Um, listen to these, these statements from uh, the Gospels about giving. It's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, generosity, gifts from God. Ask and it will be given you. Give and it will be given you. The measure you give will be the measure you get back. Freely you have received, freely give. All seem to be teachings about participating in a generous flow of life, freely receiving the bounty of God, uh, asking freely, receiving freely, and giving freely. It's kind of like participating in a great flow uh, of giving and receiving. But I don't think it's uh, so. They're emphasizing that as part of uh, a part of the life abundant, participating in that way. Um, but nowhere is it suggested that that necessarily means materially. Um, all kinds of giving, I think, uh, not necessarily all materially. What kind of giving is most rewarding, would you say, from your own experience? What kind of giving brings the richest blessings? I think it's helpful to kind of examine our gift history. I think we all have a gift history, don't we? The families we grew up in, for instance, what we learned about gift giving and gift receiving. Um, probably some, some useful lessons to draw from that. My own uh, family, my parents, I was reflecting and sort of remembering how they felt about gifts. <clears throat> Neither one of them really liked them much. <laughs> uh, my, my father at Christmas time, uh, really the only things he wanted were uh, some I call consumables. Um, he liked uh, peanut brittle. He always win with a box of peanut brittle. He liked um, uh, King Edward cigars box of those. Uh, I still can see that very familiar King Edward box of cigars. Sure. Uh, or a Sir Walter Raleigh uh, pipe tobacco. Um, he would always win with those. Anything else he did not like uh, and was actually distressed by. I'm not sure why. Just the accumulation of the buildup of stuff maybe, but I was never happy with them. My mother too, she never liked her gifts. Uh, and I remember always feeling bad about that. We ne no one knew what she wanted. Uh, and she didn't, and never said, said what she wanted, so I always seemed to be disappointed. Um, she always got pajamas or evening in Paris perfume. <laughs> <laughs> so no, 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 evening in Paris.
Paris. <laughs> That's probably what would have really made her happy, would be a real evening in Paris. <laughs> uh, away from uh, the little town and the beauty shop and the hecticness of the Christmas season. Uh, um, so it never seemed like there was a lot of satisfaction with the stuff that was exchanged at Christmas time. Um, and I think that happens a lot, doesn't it? And sometimes the more stuff, uh, the less satisfaction. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Christmas some years ago, quite a few years ago, I was at my brother's home and uh, my niece and nephew were really young still, I think maybe four and six, something like that. And it's like, uh, I remember as the Christmas, everybody got too much. It was just too much. Uh, grandparents had come up from Florida, I was there. Uh, uh, the parents had given lots and, and so for the children, it was just like a mountain of stuff a mountain of stuff under the tree. So the madness of Christmas morning, ripping through the gifts, tearing paper and ribbons off, and, and as soon as the, a glimpse of the package was, it was cast aside, and then there was another one before this one was even unwrapped, and ripping the papers off, and, and, and frantic, frantic gift tearing open, energy. Uh, they couldn't get through them all, and they started to cry and whine and carry on. They had to take a, a, a break from the unwrapping of gifts for naps. Everyone got so cranky and tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a good image of, I think, of, uh, there's a lesson in that. There's, there's, you know, less satisfaction with more stuff. Uh, uh, and I think there are, that, that seems to be a principle I've drawn, a lesson drawn for me, that the joy of giving goes up as the consumerism goes down. As the consumerism goes up, the joy goes down. Has anyone else had a, a, such an experience? I think that's a useful lesson to kind of keep in mind heading into uh, the gift-giving season. It isn't a matter of uh, black and white. It's not like there's anything wrong with uh, exchanging material things. Uh, but I think it's a matter of perspective or emphasis, that it really isn't about more stuff doesn't equal more joy, correct? Um, in fact, you know, one little special thing sometimes, or something that costs nothing at all, um, has uh, more joy, uh, carrying capacity somehow. I, I think in my life, in my experience, maybe yours as well, that often the best gifts have been had little to do with money. Um, that they might not have cost anything at all, or might have been very simple things. Um, so that's something to think about, I think, as we head into the gift-giving season. Are there are so, there's some strategies or, or lessons we can keep in mind so that we can kind of get the most out of this season of, of, of gift-giving and receiving? I think there are. One strategy, and I think I've used it a lot, I bet a number of you have, is the uh, whole idea of re-gifting. Re-gifting, uh, which is the giving of, uh, passing along something valued, um, something with history quite often, uh, to someone that you know will appreciate that um, in a unique way. Re-gifting uh, of things. Um, and I think that's sort of embedded in those, those spiritual teachings. It's, Given it shall be given to you, freely you have received, freely give. There is an exchange, there is a, path, there's a giving of, uh, passing along of gifts. You've received gifts, you pass along gifts. Uh, I've always found interesting the idea of, uh, there's an old idiom of calling someone an Indian giver. For that one, it's probably not very politically correct to use that phrase, but, uh, but I thought it was interesting, the history of it. Um, the idiom, the conventional meaning of that is to take something back that you've given someone. That's what they would, would say that phrase means. But the original meaning of it, it's from a, a book called The Gift by Lewis Hyde. The original meaning of it was that this is a, describing a cardinal property of the gift, that whatever we've been given is supposed to be given away again, not kept. Or if it's kept, something of similar value should move on in its stead. There should be this, this, this giving back again. Uh, and, and the idea is that that keeps the spirit of the gift alive. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, because there, from experience, I've, uh, you know, I know that there's no um, increasing satisfaction from greater accumulation of stuff. Would you agree? It's not about accumulating and stockpiling, getting as much as you can and keeping it, hanging on to it, and that'll bring more joy. No, it's about keeping the flow going. It's about giving it back out. Uh, and often it's the same things. We, you know, we, we pass along things that have been precious to us uh, to someone else we know they'll be precious to them. There's a great joy that comes from that. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. the, a, a 
joy that's greater than just having a lot and continuing to build our stockpile uh, with greater accumulation. Uh, it feels right. It's, um, it seems like a principle that, that uh, feels right on the inside. And I feel it more as I get older, the, uh, the joy of passing things along to someone who will appreciate them. Um, I think it's true that in our lives, in our, our gift giving and receiving history as we go through life, there are stages where uh, we're more into acquisition uh, and stages when we're more into distribution. Um, I'm at my ripe old age now. I'm more into distribution. Uh, any of you? Uh, it's like uh, I don't need to acquire. Uh, it's not something. But there was a time when I remember being very focused on, I, you know, a, a need to uh, accumulate, a, a need to acquire more. There are stages of life. Young families with, with children, they need more stuff. They're more into acquisition and accumulating things that they, they feel are needed. Uh, but I think at any stage of life, we can all be blessed by the practice of, of regifting, of putting back out into circulation and not just stockpiling and saving up and storing up. I've been given some beautiful regifted items down through the years. I bet some of you have as well. A uh, beautiful uh, blue bowl. Uh, it's a handmade uh, bowl that uh, my dear friend Mary uh, Olson gave me. Uh, once that we use for our burning bowl ceremony, which we'll have in a few weeks. Uh, that was a re-gift, something that she had uh, treasured uh, and wanted me to have now to treasure as she was going through uh, a change in her life, moving uh, right-sizing uh, in, uh, in her life. There's a lot of things like that we can pass along, very special, have nothing to do with, with money or, or getting goods or things like that, but just a sharing of gifts we already have and want to share with others, want to share that blessing. Second one is you know, re-gifting, also just giving of our intri intrinsic gifts, you know, the gifts of who we are, of our talents, our skills, our abilities. I think Jesus' words, freely you have received, freely give, mean that as well, uh, particularly uh, in a non-material way. When you think about those disciples and, and their itinerant sort of ministry, going around uh, teaching, sharing wisdom teachings, um, Jesus is telling them, freely you have received, freely give. Um, they didn't, what they were giving was who they were, what they had learned, you know, with uh, the, the healing energy, the peace that was flowing through them. That's what he meant. Share that. Give that freely. Freely you've received, uh, give that out freely. Um, so he wasn't really talking about material stuff, he was talking about their intrinsic gifts. And in that way, we've all received tremendous gifts from one another, haven't we? Some of my best gifts have been things people created from their talent for me. I have a poem a friend wrote for me, a song, um, things like that. Um, gifts of who we are, the talents, the gifts that we've been given and we share them with others. It's a wonderful scripture from uh, 1 Corinthians about this, that how we've each been given gifts that we're meant to share uh, as a part of the common good, as a part, a part of the, the common goodness of life. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. There's a lot packed into that. He goes on to, in the scripture, uh, Paul goes on to talk about, uh, you know, to one is given the, uh, the, the spirit of the utterance of wisdom to share, uh, to another faith, to another healing, healing energy through them, to another uh, understanding of various tongues, languages, I like that, to another the interpretation of tongues, various gifts we have, people have gifts for certain things. There are healers, there are speakers, there are teachers. There are people who understand languages. And we're meant to share those. Uh, so the gifts we share, these intrinsic gifts, depend on who we are. What gifts of the spirit we happen to have been given in our lives. And thank God we have such a wonderful variety of gifts among us that all contribute uh, to the rich bounty of life, the abundance of life. Um, and Joe and me, with our love of music, um, it flows in that way pretty often, like we like to do uh, a little music in nursing homes, things like that. This time of year is a wonderful time to do that. 
Um, it's something that comes naturally to us that's joyful, and we always get more praise than we deserve, you know, because we just go in and do it and sing songs. But people for whom music is not, uh, you know, a regular part of their lives really appreciate the blessing of that. Linda Joel will be joining us at one in a, a week or so. We do one every year. Um, that's a great, easy way gifts flow through us in a way that bless, contribute to the common good, bless others, uh, natural to us. Other people do different kinds of things. Um, well, we have the pleasure of participating in Bill Cohen's Thanksgiving uh, concert he does every year uh, on Friday. It's kind of an alternative to uh, Black Friday's usual activities. He has a kind of a, a concert in a church uh, uh, songs of thanksgiving, songs of gratitude, and what, what we're great, grateful for, and lots of songs that express that. And uh, all the many, many people who, who came to enjoy that, Bill pour, pouring his energy into that, sharing his ability, uh, his music, his voice, um, and people uh, receiving that gratefully. People also giving a gift, a donation to uh, the uh, group he was fundraising for with that concert which is a, a, a medical a mission trip that they, his wife goes on, Randy Cohen, each year to the Dominican Republic. And it's a group of all volunteer doctors and nurses who provide medical aid to the poor in, in this area of the Dominican Republic. And everyone who goes is a volunteer and they, they all commit to taking $500 worth of, uh, of medical um, resources or money for that. Um, they all pay they, their own expenses. So all the, the donations at the door for this Thanksgiving concert went to support that. And Randy Cohen's uh, activity, along with the doctors and nurses who are sharing their gifts of healing uh, with people, she's sharing her gift of, of translation. She, uh, she's fluent, she's bilingual, so she does translating there. She has the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Uh, that's a gift she shares along with her uh, willing spirit. So it's wonderful to think about. What a wonderful outpouring of gifts all around. Bill Cohen sharing his voice and his instruments and bringing other musicians in, people coming to hear that and receiving those gifts and giving gifts back of their own, the donations to support this medical mission trip. And the people that go on that, the doctors and nurses and translators and all the gift uh, involved in that, freely giving uh, their, their gifts, their intelligence, their, their ability to speak, to communicate. To heal. Remarkable. What a, what a beautiful sharing of gifts um, that is. Sometimes just the biggest gift of all is showing up. Being willing to show up in a difficult situation or time with who you are and do what you can to help. Uh, which is what a lot of those mission trip folks, all those doctors and nurses and translators were doing. I don't know about you, but some, some of the greatest gifts I've been given were moments in my life when someone was just able to be with me at a difficult time. I think of it as fearless presence. Fearless presence, someone being willing to be with you in a difficult moment, bringing who they are, bringing who they are to it and doing what they can. Sometimes in times of extraordinary challenges, uh, extraordinary giving results. And we've seen lots of examples of that lately, I think, with some of the things going on in our world and the tremendous uh, healing needed. Um, I've been reading uh, uh, in a few places lately, catching articles about this uh, wonderful chef, uh, Chef Jose Andre. Uh, he's a Michelin-starred uh, Spanish-American chef who lives in, D in DC. Um, and he, so his gift is cooking. Uh, that's the gift he shares with the world, and he's uh, quite good at it, um, especially the ability to cook for a lot of people with what you have on hand. Um, so he flew to Puerto Rico to see what he could do. Uh, and he thought he'd go and see if he could help feed a few thousand people. He got one of the first flights that opened up uh, to get into Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria struck. This was in September. And uh, he didn't have any plan. Uh, he was just hoped to help out with, with feeding uh, some folks for a while down there. Um, but when he got there, he realized there was absolutely no plan for feeding Puerto Rico. The power was out everywhere. Uh, even clean water was difficult to get. Um, he realized there was nothing in place, and he knew what his gifts were, and he was ready to put them into, into motion. 
Uh, so he, he said within a week, he and his team opened really the biggest restaurant in the world. They call it World Central Kitchen. Uh, he, he said, how crazy is that? <laughs> within a week, he put this together. Uh, he formed a team, chefs for Puerto Rico, and, um, and it's still going strong, and he's still there uh, months later, uh, of course. Um, within a, for the first month, they were set up in a parking lot uh, of the largest stadium in Puerto Rico, cooking stews and paella for all comers. It just grew organically because of the sharing of gifts. A church would come and say, uh, we could do some cooking in our kitchen. Would you like to use our kitchen? Uh, food, tr uh, food truck, independently owned food truck people would started to distribute that food and get it out and just taking it down different streets. Um, places that, that you know, had generators running that they could store food offered their services. Um, and it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, churches came to them, you know, asking if they could help out. Um, they're changing, these chefs for Puerto Rico are changing how food aid after a disaster is being made available, uh, the, 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 which is different from the way it's been done in the past, waiting for packages to come in by flights. They're on the ground, uh, locally provided, uh, very organic, using what you've got, people you've got, resources you've got, right here, right now, on the spot. Um, so they have to date served some three million meals it's mind-boggling. Just on Thanksgiving this, uh, this past week, uh, Jose and his team prepared uh, some 40,000 Thanksgiving meals. Uh, and they're little he does little Twitter videos uh, to show uh, what he's doing. These are meals of turkey, corn, potatoes, and cranberries. Those Twitter videos from early that morning, Thanksgiving morning, is a chef beside him stirring a huge cauldron of gravy, and he says, you want to make gravy? Come to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> I love that spirit, that energy. Incredible what he's been able to do um, with his team of chefs um, feeding millions of people. Um, it's just amazing. He really all over Puerto Rico, again, uh, and they're still without power, still struggling. So, and it's going to be a long recovery process. All kinds of people are rising to the occasion with the gifts they have to share. I was reading an article about a young college student, Natalia Arcila, one semester shy of graduating from college with a degree in biology. The hurricane uh, struck. Um, so she's finishing classes, but they're all outside now. No computers, no technology. Um, she's, she's still finishing classes, but also, uh, working with a foundation to distribute water filters around the island. There's a hotel owner, uh, so we use the gifts we have. There's a hotel owner who, you know, in the business of hospitality, taking care of people, a uh, uh, hotel at the old San Juan Hotel, has the only lit up doorway for blocks and blocks because they have a diesel generator operating. And he sets a grill up in the street in front of the hotel every night where people can come and gather and cook hot dogs and ribs. And he serves miraculously cold beer. <laughs> I just think that's a remarkable gift, isn't it? And at Halloween time, which was of course in the midst of this desperate time, he brought in a makeup artist for kids, a face painter so that the children who gathered there every evening could have their faces, put scary faces on. A flash of joy in a, in a dark city, the sharing of gifts, the makeup artist, the hotel owner, the people bringing food to share on the grill, people distributing water filters, the people cooking, cooking, cooking. What a remarkable gift it is when people just show up as who they are and share the gifts they've been given. Miracles can occur. It's amazing. So our role, you know, is always, and maybe that's something to keep in mind in this gift-giving season, <clears throat> the primary thing is us, showing up as who we are, sharing what we have to share, let our gifts symbolize that, whatever the material ones are. Uh, but keep the focus on the spirit of the gift, keep the spirit of the gift alive. It isn't so much the stuff itself and accumulating more of it. It's the, it's the blessing we want to exchange. Uh, more than the, than the gift itself. But we keep the gift flowing with, with sharing who we are, with showing up as who we are, and giving what we can in generosity. Freely I've received and freely I give, participating in the great flow of life. Let me say that again, maybe we can say that together. Freely I've received and freely I give, 
participating in the great flow of life. Let's do it once more. <laughs> freely I have received and freely I give, participating in the great flow of life. Let's take that into prayer for a moment and affirm that intention again. How blessed we are to have the opportunity to share our gifts with the world, the gifts given to us by God within. Whatever those gifts are, each one of us is a channel for those graces to flow out into the world. All those talents, all those abilities, all those skills, all these rich gifts we've been given, it is our privilege and our joy to share them freely. And as we do that, we are all abundantly blessed. Thank you, God, for your graces in our lives. So it is. Amen.